and I would like to say that it is really a delightful pleasure to be able to moderate this session and I am really excited to discuss the topic uh, for today. So the topic is tapping into the one trillion dollar industry, empowering the African youth to build resilient and sustainable agribusinesses. And you know, I'll start this panel by, by quoting the president of the African Development Bank, Akinumi Adishino. He said, the size of food and agriculture in Africa will rise to one trillion dollars by 2030. Yes, you heard that right. One trillion dollars. The population of Africa, now at 1.2 billion, will double to 2.5 billion by 2050. These 2.5 billion people must eat, and only through food and agribusiness can this be achieved. End quote. So I would say that this is a huge, huge opportunity for the African youth. To discuss this, we have invited four distinguished panelists who are entrepreneurs and experts in the industry, having spent years building profitable and sustainable agribusinesses on the continent. I'll go ahead to read the short bios of our panelists, just to give you an idea just how much of experts they are in discussing this topic. And I'll start with Peter Ndrojo, our co-founder and group CEO at Twigger Foods. Our co-founder and group CEO of Twigger, which is a B2B e-commerce industry that focuses on food and grocery in the informal retail. Twigger currently employs 1,000 people and serves 30,000 customers every month. Prior to taking up his role, Peter spent 21 years with Coca-Cola on his last role, being president of the West and Central Africa Business Unit. Peter was also the president of the American Chamber of Commerce in Kenya, a director of the American Business Council in Nigeria, and has been voted among the top 100 young leaders in Africa by Forbes Africa and top 40 under 40 by the business lady in Kenya. Peter holds a Master of Business Administration in Strategic Management, a Bachelor of Science degree in International Business Administration from the US International University in Kenya, and an Executive Leadership Program from the Harvard Business School. Uh, Peter, are you with us? Uh, just to say hi before I move on to the person. Hi, Amar. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure being here and looking forward to an enlightening conversation. Awesome. Looking forward to the same. All right. I will move ahead to introduce the next panelist. You can move the slide, please. So I will now introduce Olari Waju Wilton Wadal, who is a business thought leader with vast experience in multiple industries across finance, oil and gas, agribusiness, and FMCG. His background is in asset management at Asset Management Corporation of Nigeria and banking at Guarantee Trust Bank. He holds an MBA from the IE Business School. Uh, Larry, are you there? Um, hi, Ramat. Yes, I'm here. Um, it's a pleasure awesome. to be here and I'm looking forward Thank to you so much. engaging. All right. So I'll move on to Josephine. Who is, this, uh, who is South African born, Congolese by origin, founder of Biakudia Urban Farming Solutions, an urban agricultural startup, which aims to reconcile city dwellers to their food and environment through urban agriculture. Josephine is passionate about raising awareness and moreover implementing viable solutions on issues surrounding health, sustainability, and access to healthy and affordable food in cities. Her passion is in transformation in the food ecosystem, further manifested in her work at the Wakanda Food Accelerator, where she works full-time as the operations coordinator. Her mission is to be part of the movement of young Africans working towards having a prosperous food ecosystem for all those who live on the continent. She holds a bachelor's degree in accounting and economics from the University of Johannesburg. Uh, Josephine, hi. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Ramat. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. Awesome. So our uh, last but definitely not the least, I'll introduce Peter Ngui, who is the founder of Early Bird Venture Lab and former president at Brick, an African tech startup that builds rugged connectivity hardware. Early Bird is a Nairobi-based venture lab that focuses on providing funding interventions and growth strategy to African companies. Peter is passionate about business strategies and investment in emerging markets. 
is the founder of the Global South Think Tank, Glow South ITT, and believes that Africans are best positioned to sharp their own path to solving many business challenges by leveraging their geniuses and localized solutions. Working with some of Africa's fastest growing startups like Market Force and Africa's Pocket, uh, Peter loves to travel, is an adrenaline junkie and a blogger about both his others. Welcome, Peter. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for having me. All right. So uh, as you would notice, we have two Peters on this panel. So uh, I would just you know, say uh, Peter of Twigger Foods and Peter of Early Bird, uh, just so we can distinguish um, between both of you. So again, I'd say thank you so much to all four panelists for joining this discussion today. And you know, we will just dive right into the topic of the discussion. Just to remind us all, the topic is tapping into the $1 trillion industry, empowering the African youth to build resilient and sustainable businesses. So I'll start with uh, Peter of Twitter Foods. So I want to talk about this in particular. How is Twitter Foods helping to transform the food landscape in East Africa? So I'll, let us, I'll, I'll have us get started on that first. Thank you so much, uh, Ramit. So just to give uh, some context, across the continent, uh, consumers are spending about uh, 50 to 60% of their disposable income on food. Now, just for comparison purposes, this is equivalent to how much consumers were spending in the US in the 1870s. That's about 150 years ago. And when you look at the uh, numbers today, countries like the US now are spending 6.2%. Most of the EU are below 10%. And there's a factor of rising incomes in those countries, but also there's a factor of uh, absolute cost of food. Now, when you look at uh, the continent, at the core of uh, inefficiency in the production of food is what I call a fragmented retail. I think sometimes we look at the farming ecosystem and don't look at the market side in terms of uh, where the problem actually lies. Because of the fragmented retail, it is very, very difficult for you to actually have commercial investment in food production uh, dovetailing into that type of uh, ecosystem. For comparison purposes, South Africa, 60% of retail is formal. So you have big supermarkets that account for about 60% of uh, food retail, or let's say retail in total. As a result of that, you've had very efficient farming ecosystems developed to support that retail ecosystem. And today, South Africans spend about 16 to 20% of their disposable income on food, which is about half the rest of uh, the continent. So the key thing is that we need to find ways in which we can leverage technology to aggregate the demand of informal retail, because that's not about to change. And I'll explain why a little bit later. If you look at markets like Nigeria, 98% informal. You look at Kenya, 80% informal. So the small roadside stalls that are selling food are not about to go away. So we need to find ways in which we can leverage technology, aggregate this demand, and start building efficient supply chains that feed into that type of uh, retail ecosystem. Without that, agriculture will then still remain a very, very, um, what I'd call um, um, poorly structured uh, industry, where we're talking about an opportunity of $1 trillion, but we cannot access it. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing those you know, statistics. And I believe I am a firm believer in statistics helping to inform you know, business decisions. And like I've said, we really need to actually leverage technology to aggregate demand and, and build efficient supply chains. And you know, uh, based on the work that you have shared and the work that you do at Swigger Foods, what emerging threats are you beginning to see in the African food industry? And how specifically can aspiring young entrepreneurs create opportunities out of these trends? So the thing is that uh, when we look at food, I see three big emerging trends uh, on the continent. The first is a trend around what I call household disposable income. And if you look at household disposable income on a per capita basis, what's happening on the continent is that uh, if you look at it in terms of um, nominal terms, uh, the trend is somewhat flattish to uh, very, very low single-digit growth, maybe over the next uh, five to 10 years. But when you adjust it for inflation, it's actually negative, which means that 
a household that is spending maybe a thousand naira to buy a certain amount of goods today in Lagos will not be able to buy the same amount of goods with a thousand naira in a year's time. And I think we're all living through that reality where the price of everything is going up. So one of the things that we're seeing is that households will actually be stressed for affordability. And what we will see in that type of scenario is that uh, brands, especially in the food space, might become less relevant as people become more price sensitive. And there will be a bigger opportunity for us to be more efficient in terms of how we farm and how we pass on some of those benefits to consumers so that they're able to meet their daily requirements. So, and I think that's a big, big macro trend that we're seeing uh, coming through, and especially with COVID that has disrupted household incomes. This is bound to accelerate in the next uh, couple of years because yes, now we're dealing with a disease in the next couple of years, we'll be dealing with the consequences of the pandemic. The second thing that we're seeing coming through is that uh, Africa is urbanizing at close to 2x the rate of population growth, which means that the number of people moving to urban areas is significantly more than the general population growth. Now, uh, countries like West Africa are very, very urbanized, about 50% urbanized, and that's still continuing to grow. But when you move to the east coast of a continent, about 25 to 30% urbanized and continuing to grow. Now, when you have this rate of urbanization, what we're seeing is that government infrastructure is not keeping up with the rate of population growth in the cities. And what is bound to happen is that we will see an increase in informal settlements, and we will also see an increase in informal retail. So as I mentioned, informal retail is not about to go away. If you look at, for example, Nigeria, uh, ShopRite just closed its doors. So which means that right now you actually don't have a major supermarket chain in a market like Nigeria, which is the largest economy on the continent. So when you start looking at it from that perspective, this is a mega trend that is bound to continue in sub-Saharan Africa. The third thing that I find very, very interesting on the continent is that uh, telcos are actually facing a significant amount of competition from applications like WhatsApp. So we're seeing an erosion in uh, voice revenues and SMS revenues. So most of the telcos are actually upgrading their infrastructure to ensure that they're able to offer data services. But the consequence of this is that a significant number of people will be pushed from feature phones to smartphones in about a 12 to 18 month period. And what you will have is a significant increase in mobile internet penetration across the continent happening at the same time. So what this tells me is that there's an opportunity in production of food and producing it efficiently. There's an opportunity to focus in the urban areas because that's where the issue is bound to be most dire. And the third thing is that there's an opportunity to ensure that you're able to leverage technology in delivering this proposition because internet penetration is about to explode across the continent. That is simply amazing. I mean, even starting from here, you've really blown my mind away with these three opportunities. And, you know, just to recap what you said, you've mentioned the opportunity linked closely with the trend around the disposable income and how youth can actually, you know, leverage on this price sensitivities also on the movement of people to the urban areas. And I actually just wanted to mention that, now I believe this is one of the solutions that um, Josephine in particular is trying to, you know, pro uh, profile forward in terms of the Biakudia, uh, a Biakudia company that is, you know, creating urban farms. I'll come to Josephine very soon so that she can tell us more about this. And you've mentioned the whole trend around the mobile phones and the telco in infrastructure. And thank you so much for mentioning all of that. And, you know, one thing I have seen when you're sharing all of these ideas is that, you know, creating these big, bold ideas is really one thing. And then running with the ideas over the long term is another. So given your experience starting Twigger and working with and mentoring young people, what would you say are most critical for African youths to actually build and implement sustainable businesses? You know, and you know, I want you to link this uh, with the perspective of fundraising as well, because I can imagine many young people on this call are saying, oh, I now have this idea. Uh, Peter of two guys talking about this and this, but I don't have money to start a business. And, you know, so I want you to help us link all of those together. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ramat. I, I strongly believe that uh, every journey starts with a single step. 
So one of the things that uh, I normally find is that, especially when you're starting a business, is have a clear understanding of a problem that you're trying to solve. Uh, because Agri is a very, very wide space. And I was kind of just listening to Obi uh, share a little bit about uh, the Agri opportunity, talking about logistics to aggregation. So when you're talking about Agri, it's a very, very wide area. So the key thing is that, you know, pick an area that is uh, an area that you have a good understanding of and essentially is really, really scoped out. Because when you start a business, and especially if you have a very, very wide scope, chances are that you get overwhelmed and then there's so many things coming at you from all directions. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that once you identify the small area, then have a bold vision. How do you want to transform that area? Because if you take a small area, you think very boldly over a wide, wide geography, then the numbers start to stack up. Because most investors, what they're looking for is total addressable market. How big is this opportunity that you're talking about? The third thing I would say is that, uh, and I think this is a piece that is really, really overlooked, build a good team. Now, at times, you know, people are like, you know what, how do I build a good team if I don't even have the money to start with? And that's why you find that many startups have co-founders. And the whole idea around having a co-founder is actually going and finding somebody who's like-minded who complements a skill that you do not have. Because at the end of the day, yes, you're the sponsor for the vision, but at the end of the day, you need people who are able to execute that vision. So in the case of uh, Twitter, I had to get a co-founder and also have a management team that I also consider my fellow co-founders. And the whole idea is that I had to then bring on board people who would then take on equity. And this is very, very important who will then take on equity as part of their compensation. Because in the early days, you cannot afford competitive salaries vis-a-vis -vis the market. You have to find other ways in which you're able to attract talent and inspire that talent to execute against the vision that you set out to achieve. Then the third, the, the fourth thing that I would then say is that uh, you need to start small and have small means. Um, as uh, Obi mentioned, you know, he lived in Kano, and I know Obi very well, you know, he lived in Kano for a whole year as he was setting out Kobo 360. The key thing is that you need to find a way to start very, very small, have small wins and document these small wins, which actually prove that your business model is working. Then the last thing that is very, very important, I think this is a piece that uh, um, many people uh, kind of uh, don't connect, tell your story. Find a way to tell your story in a way that is compelling because it, it is all about storytelling. When somebody is sitting in San Francisco, when somebody is sitting in New York, somebody is sitting in London, they've not been to, uh, they've not been to Kano, they've not been to Ibadan, they've not been to Nairobi, they've not been to any of these places. So the key thing is that the only way you can capture the imagination is how well you're able to tell the story, articulating the opportunity, the total addressable market, the team that you've built to execute against the vision, the small wins that you have, and essentially what it is that you need to be successful. And when you're able to put all this together, what you find is that uh, there will be people who will be willing to listen to you. So what I say is that, you know, don't give up. And of course, when it comes to fundraising, leverage networks that exist. The key thing is that, you know, we, we essentially have pioneered um, a lot of this startup space. We're willing to uh, provide uh, mentorship or even uh, point you in the right direction when it comes to fundraising, the type of investment that uh, you was, you're seeking. And by leveraging this ecosystem, you know, GB over Flutterwave does it very well. Kobo, uh, Obi does it very well. We're trying to do the same thing here in East Africa. And once we create this uh, ecosystem of founders, the whole idea is how do we then ensure that we're also creating a vibrant ecosystem that actually is able to fund startups. But the most important thing is that do your homework. Uh, because at the end of the day, if you don't do your homework and uh, your idea is not well cooked, then that essentially also compromises. Uh, your ability to succeed. Thank you so much, uh, Peter. Uh, those are really amazing. And uh, I would just dwell on three things that you've said in terms of one, bringing in the human capacity that would help you know, with the expertise as well as the fundraising, 
starting small, really critical. Thank you for sharing that. And also to tell the story, tell your story as you go along your journey. Thank you so much for sharing that. I want to go to uh, Josephine now. I'll come back to you, Peter, for one quick uh, final question. But uh, really quickly moving on to Josephine. So, and um, before I take uh, your question, Josephine, I would like to um, inform our participants that, of course, you can ask your questions by typing in the chat. You can send them directly to me, Rahmat Eifunjewu, so that we can pick it up and you know, um, go away with it first. So, Josephine, now to you. You know, you are an example of a young, passionate, and thriving woman in Af African agriculture, and we definitely love to see that. But, you know, why agriculture? What problems are you trying to solve through your company, uh, BUFS, and what is your biggest motivation that keeps you on track? Thank you, Ramat. Um, again, greetings to everybody. Um, I think that's a very good question. Um, it's something that I've asked myself quite a few times because I never saw myself going into agriculture or into the food space or the food um, industry. Um, but I'd say that agriculture found me um, as probably many of us in this call. Um, I'd say that through a series of various events, um, I was led to agriculture. Um, I think if I had to start telling all the dots that connect, um, it would take the whole day. But as you said in my introduction in the bio, I am originally from the DRC. And in 2000 and a few years back, I had gone to visit the DRC. Um, and someone had taken me to a farm. And, you know, I think from there, that was probably the catalyst as to, you know, how how much resources we have in Africa. And, you know, I started doing my research and I started reading. And I say my respect um, for agriculture grew through that experience. Um, when they're telling me that Africa could feed the world, um, Congo itself can feed the world. And for me, um, I came to realize that agriculture is the backbone of who we are. Um, I started to see connections with agriculture with everywhere from our health, um, a health situation that my father is currently going through and went through. I see how food impacts the health. I see how it impacts our economies. I see how it's the environment. I mean, everything links back to food. Um, and I think once you've realized all these things, there's no going back. So I think that bug bit me. And I told myself, you know, when I start, you start seeing the, the impact as a young person that you can have, you say, if not me, who? And if not now, when? I mean, we can sit and complain about the many problems that we have, um, but it's up to us to come up with solutions. Um, I like what the previous speaker said, that um, you focus on one solution and you do a good job at it. Um, there are many, many problems. And I think for me, um, the one solution that I wanted to focus on being that I live in the city, so I was born and raised in Johannesburg, was to kind of solve the disconnect that urban dwellers have with their food and environment. Um, like Peter said, in South Africa, 70% of our retail is formal retail. So in Johannesburg in particular, we have this perception that food just comes from the store. Um, a lot of people um, don't know that there's a whole process that goes through growing food and there's farmers out there and there's nature involved and the kind of food that we're eating. So there's that total disconnect, um, especially with the urban poor, where it's, um, you know, it's just eat um, and they have to get food in their stomachs and, you know, um, they're not looking at the health, they're not looking at the environment. Um, and for me, that was a major problem that I found in the city and being that, um, urban populations are growing even more. I ask myself, what, what, what solution can we look into to reconnecting these city dwellers to their food and environment? And that's when I started Biakudia Urban Farming Solutions. Um, so our mission is, of course, to reconnect city dwellers to their food and um, environment through urban agriculture, through the various services that we provide, um, where people realize that... Um, agriculture is a whole process and growing your own food is a process and it's something that you can do and you can bring it closer to the city and closer to your homes um, 
and also the fact that um, you can also have a say in your health. Um, I think we've been talking so much about agriculture um, and one thing we don't look at, I think one thing particularly in South Africa that's a problem is health. Um, yes, we have all this food and we're growing all this food, but um, we look at like the COVID situation where um, a lot of people's um, health was compromised in COVID because of their eating habits. You know, we can think, talk about a vaccine and we can talk about medicine, but the real medicine is in our food. And how do we get people to realize that, especially those who are living in the city? Um, and you asked uh, my biggest motivation. I think it's something that I mentioned before is probably the fact that the continent needs young people like myself and everybody else in this chat um, in the entire food value chain to drive positive impact and growth. Um, again, I go back to that quote that says, if not me, who, and if not now, when? Um, you know, that's, that's my motivation, like to keep me going and saying that we want to look back 50 years from now, 40 years from now and say that, you know, we, we worked hard and we, we tried our best to, to drive the agricultural industry um, in Africa. I mean, if it's not us who push this $1 trillion economy, someone else will come from outside and leverage this. Um, so I think as an African youth, um, that's my motivation. Thank you so much, uh, Josephine. And, you know, one thing that struck at me from what you've said is that if not you, who would? And if not now, when? And I believe this is one thing that um, other youth out there can actually key into. you are focused on the problems and you have, you know, channeled your energies into creating solutions. Mm -hmm. And then I also ask, so what are the key lessons from your journey so far? And uh, especially coming from the perspective of being a female in the sector. Um, I think I, I can go back to the previous um, female who spoke uh, in the other panel. Um, for me, it's not really something that I've really kept stuck in my mind. I mean, yes, I, I, I know as females, we have various challenges, but I think the as an entrepreneur, we all face similar challenges. Um, but a key lesson for me that I've learned and that I can impart to others is make sure the solution that you're providing is actually the solution. I think we, we, we try to provide solutions to a problem thinking that that's the solution. And maybe there's another problem behind the solution that needs to be solved before you solve your solution. So I think really do your research um, and make sure that what the solution you're bringing forth is something that's actually needed and it's something that people um, or the communities you're trying to serve or the groups you're trying to serve actually need that solution. Um, like the gentleman spoke earlier, you can't bring tech to someone who doesn't even know how to read. Um, so that's a big lesson for me is making sure that I understand the solution and I understand it from the point of the problem, uh, from the person who has a problem and then bring your solution. Um, and then another key lesson for me is perseverance. Um, I think that it's easy to start something, but to keep going when the chips are down and when things are tough and there's no business and there's so much things against you. And I think as an, um, an African entrepreneur, like <laughs> that's almost every day. I think perseverance is important. It's very, very important. Um, if you know that you're solving the right solution and you know that um, it's needed, um, just persevere and eventually things do get better. Thank you so much, uh, Josephine. In the interest of time, I'll quickly move on to Langre of Dilo Foods and I'll settle okay. back for one final question. So uh, Langre, I understand that you do not have a background in uh, agriculture, but here you are, you've launched Dilo Foods. And so I want to ask a couple of questions. I'll just shoot them out at you uh, for our young people out there uh, who also you know, do not have this kind of background and are looking to venture into agribusiness and tap into one, this $1 trillion industry. So you know, what in inspired you to venture into agribusiness as an entrepreneur? And the second question would really be, you know, what were your expectations at the beginning and what are, are the experiences so far? And did the two actually match up? And um, another one I would want you to address while you're at it is, you know, what are the plans uh, for Dilo Foods and how is your company working towards achieving this plans in the uh, short to mid term? 
All right, thank you very much, Ramat. Um, very interesting question you asked. I get that question a lot because um, my background was more in finance and asset management, like you mentioned earlier. Um, but I will say one word. Literally, how I got into every business is sustainability, right? Um, at the beginning of this panel discussion, you also spoke about, you quoted the words of Professor Adeshino about how in Africa, um, the population is going to double um, by 2050 and these people have to eat, right? And um, for me, that was the beginning of my surgeon into um, ag agribusiness, just looking for um, solutions and trying to feed people because all these people have to eat. Now, um, having said that, um, I would use that, this opportunity to also implore and encourage anyone who is interested in the agribusiness. Um, it can be taunting, it can be tough, but I would say now is time to start. Now is time to start. People have to eat. So please, there's enough space for everyone. If you can come in and come in with innovative products, whatever space you want to, like um, Peter said, there's so many parts of this whole um, of this whole industry. So you just have to find which one works for you and what's what problem you're trying to solve and and work with your solution. Uh, question about how the journey has been so far and um, did the experiences meet up with the expectations? <sighs> well, I would say initially definitely not. Um, when we started, when we started off, um, I would say it's been a roller coaster of emotions, right? When we started off, the, the first thing that really hit us was um, getting the approved government regulation um, to start. Our, like in Nigeria, we call it the NAFDAQ certificate. And you can imagine having everything up and running. You have your equipment, you've made all the, you've secured investments, you have your human capital, everything was ready to go. And it took us another year, about, I think, 13 months to get our, um, our approval to start. That also, you know, at first was, was quite a daunting um, and very discouraging thing. And I, and I would implore anyone who, and I also say that anyone who is interested in going into this should, um, especially the processing side, because we're in the processing side, um, to be able to, to be ready for, for such an um, uphill task as to um, the NAFDAQ, um, get to your NAFDAQ certification. Um, about, um, uh, so the next thing also, right, that we found out when we started was um, the issue of, like, and, uh, like everyone has spoken, especially Peter spoke about, the lack of a better word to say, to use, I would say um, the crude, the fact that the whole value chain of the ecosystem in agribusiness, especially in Nigeria, is very crude and very informal. Um, when, we, when we started, we found that out, um, like, Peter had said before, um, the market is 98% informal. That's when it comes to the distribution channels. Even sourcing your raw materials is very informal and very fragmented. And you have the operations of people like the middlemen who also affect the whole prices and everything. So um, I would say that really, those really were the biggest shocks that we had when we started. Um, about, our, um, about our plans for DELOS, um, we're looking at diversification, uh, diversifying our, our product line and introduction of more innovative products. Um, but we're also open to more ideas from anyone who, um, if you have more ideas for us, some of the best ideas we've been able to implement was talking to brilliant minds, like a lot of people who are here. So, yeah. All right, Lamu, thank you so much for sharing that. You know, I have one question on, you know, the ecosystem in which you work. You know, many young people, you know, want to understand when I venture into agribusiness, what are the factors that would affect my business, the political economy and all of those factors. I'll leave that thought with you uh, um, while I quickly move on to Peter of early bed and I'll circle back to you for that final question. So, uh, Peter, I want I would like to actually jump right into your experience running a venture lab, starting uh, incubating startups in Nigeria. So uh, let's talk about some exciting new business ideas that you have seen. What example of innovative business models are out there for young people to benchmark uh, for their own businesses? Uh, thank you very much, Rapmat, for having me. Um, I think the first thing I want to uh, start is 
actually thinking through this one trillion number that you've introduced to us. You know, I think uh, personally, this is an opportunity for Africa based on so far, you know, we've usually lost the battle on who actually controls how we eat, you know, and especially from an agricultural point of view. Let's take some, 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 some crops, for example, to look at. You know, Kenya is the number one uh, producer of tea globally. Um, and Kenya gets only $2 billion from the tea while, you know, the global market for that is, you know, in the tens of billions. Uh, if we look at rubber, for example, it's a $200 billion uh, market, uh, which only maybe $3 billion goes to Africa. Um, Josephine has said something that I believe, like... Uh, Congo alone, DRC can feed, you know, the whole entire continent, you know, so I think what I am liking to see, uh, what I am enjoying seeing is the innovation that comes from the people who are sitting in this room today, you know, whether you're talking about Obi, uh, Landry, Josephine, uh, Peter, the way to feed Africa and the way to actually uh, move the money from going to the global West back to Africa is through technology. And I think the people who you've been talking today can be good benchmarks for how to do it. Now, how to move the, how I would look at it is who's the best benchmark person in every uh, segment. You know, when you look at logistics, you say, okay, I'm going to look at Kobo. When you look at distribution, I'm going to look at um, Twigger. When you look at, uh, you know, value addition, I'm going to look towards land rate. So I think Africans have what it needs to uh, completely benchmark from their own. The last thing I'm going to say on benchmarking, uh, as Peter said, you know, you have big supermarket or big supply chain companies that are closing down. We saw that in Nigeria. Nakumat did the same thing in, in, in Kenya. Uh, the genius on how to feed Africa and how to move food, how to value add is probably going to stand in the hands of the youth who are in this meeting today. I think that's how I would look at it. Thank you so much, Peter, for saying that. We have to look inwards to benchmark you know, our own industry. And I love that, that, um, that you've mentioned that. So uh, another thing I wanted to ask is, you know, if you look at the successful startups that you have worked with, and you've also you know, sort of brought everybody else who are on this panel into the mix, so if you look at all of these successful startups that you've worked with versus the not so successful ones, what would you say are the differentiating factors? Uh, thank you for that question. That's a really good question. I'll go back to, <laughs> to the people who've been speaking. I think they've already said a few things there. Yeah? So the first thing is, you know, Wangari Mathai, who was uh, the uh, Nobel laureate from Kenya, uh, always used to say, um, if you want to move faster, you know, go alone. If you want to move further, you know, <laughs> go together, right? So that the first thing I would want to see is of the 200 people here, everyone should ask themselves, who is going on this journey with me, right? And we have to do the journey together as an African continent. The first thing I would do is figure out who are our mentors. The good thing is from the last 20 years, we've had really, really exciting people who've gone ahead of us, right? For the younger companies, they wouldn't be raising as much money right now as we've seen because the continents keeps doubling how much money we raise almost by the year that will not happen if we do not have the cobos the twiggers you know the flutter waves the pay stacks to to lead us to where we, we need to go right so first of all we need to pay respect to people who've gone there ahead of us and use them as benchmark and mentors for our companies the second thing i would say is make sure as you're going on the journey find somebody to go with you very few so i am a farmer's kid my mom was a chicken farmer and she was a big farmer right and my dad was a dairy farmer but their companies will were never intended to be global companies or even continental companies because they did it by themselves if they found co-founders and other people to join the journey with them, they probably would have done a thousand times more than they were able to do. 
So every young person, including myself, should ask who is going on this journey with me from, the, from, from day one and keep building that, um, that, that ecosystem to, uh, to deliver results. The second thing is traction. And I think what Josephine was saying is really important. Make sure that whatever it is you're tackling, you're able to look at it from a point of, you know, can I provide value to the customers and can I va provide value to the continent? Do I have information and the genius to start tackling this problem, right? If you look at all the companies, all the people who've pitched here, they've been able to figure out what's the little part of this that I can, I can solve. Now, Peter uh, was saying, you know, just start with small steps. I really believe in that. But on the flip side, we really need to be able to start building global companies, right? The problem is big enough. The money is there, right? So I'm a recovering capitalist. I always look at the size of the problem and it's a trillion uh, dollar problem. If we don't do it right, or if we don't do it fast enough, if we don't solve it ourselves, I promise you that there are gonna be people all over the world who are willing to come and take that, which they've done again with rubber, with cocoa, with tea. So we need to start being uh, leaders, thought leaders and forerunners in how we solve our problems. So those are two things simply, your team needs to be really strong and your traction needs to look uh, a certain way to be able to uh, solve these problems. Thank you so much for mentioning all of those. And you know, I would come to you, come back to you for some, you know, um, particular solutions when it comes to the financing aspect, especially given your work. But I want to go back to uh, Peter. In fact, I want to go back to all of the speakers just for one more question. And I would like to say that we will take some to so answer direct questions from participants. So please send your questions to me so that we can address them. And so going back to Peter of Swiga Foods, my question um, on the one minute really, I would like us to take this super fast, is that, you know, um, you went from a corporate job to build Swiga Foods. And first I wanted to ask for the sake of our young people out there, has it been worth it? And on the heels of that, I want to know what are the highs and lows from your experience um, that our young aspiring entrepreneurs can draw from your journey to shape their own journey. Uh, if you can take that under one minute, that would be fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Ramat. Uh, I would say that uh, my journey has been uh, worth it. Uh, when I started Trigger, I had to sell my matrimonial home. My wife and I had to sell our matrimonial home to actually finance a business. So sometimes we see success in many years later and not understanding that the journey and the, in the initial days is normally very, very difficult when no one believes your story. So my high was actually securing uh, Goldman Sachs uh, funding. And uh, this, was, uh, this was at a time where we managed to, uh, to have our first uh, major fundraise uh, with, uh, with, a, with, a big, uh, with a big name out there. The other thing is that uh, figuring out how to become relevant or to remain relevant during the COVID season. I think this was a time, a very, very trying time for businesses. And I think for us, uh, having figured that out, uh, I think for us was a, was a high. In terms of uh, laws, the COVID uh, pandemic claimed uh, some promising farmers who were not able to, uh, whether the storm for us was, uh, was a low because uh, as a result of that, these farmers that we had backed that were not successful and that, uh, that cost a bit in, in different ways. And, uh, and the last thing uh, I would say in terms of a low is um, I'm learning what I thought would work in a startup, having spent 21 years in Coca-Cola and where you're trying things and uh, things just simply don't work because uh, you need a different set of tools and solutions to solve those types of problems to ensure that you remain relevant to your customers. So I would say that that in summary is would be my highs and lows. Thank you so much, Peter, for sharing that journey with us. I mean, it couldn't have been easy. You know, my eyes popped when you said you had to sell your home to build a company. And I hope that's really a lesson for all of us out there, really. Thank you so much. I'll move quickly to uh, Josephine now. And, you know, Josephine, when it comes to uh, the available structures of support, the resources out there that you have possibly leveraged, uh, to build yourself, to build your capacity and your business. What would you recommend for young entrepreneurs 
in out there across Africa to explore, to build their own capacity and build their agribusinesses? Um, I think for me, uh, in a minute, I'd say find your tribe. Um, so by tribe, I mean there are many like community type organizations um, like Nourishing Africa, I think is a good example um, of like-minded uh, people, mission-driven with the same goal and the same mission who provide um, opportunities and a network and a community out there. Um, I think that's, that's very important. Um, as many of the speakers spoke about having a team and having a co-founder and having um, a community of people you work with is very important. Um, I think you can find it's, it's technology has made it so easy for us. Um, so again, like I give the example of Nourishing Africa, I mean, it's, 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 an, it's a platform that could be leveraged. I mean, you guys have done a wonderful job um, finding entrepreneurs across the continent, um, finding resources on funding. Even sometimes I go there and I, I, I see the courses that you provide. Um, I think there are many opportunities out there. It's just up to us to look. Um, and when you do find it, make sure that you leverage it to your full advantage um, because there are many people out there who are willing to help and who are willing to partner. Um, so yeah, that's my minute. Awesome, Josephine. Thank you so much for mentioning Nourishing Africa. So I would implore, like you've said, I would implore everybody to really explore the website, uh, www.nourishingafrica.com uh, for a host of you know, lots of resources to build their business with. Really appreciate that. I'll move very swiftly now to um, Landry for your, your insights on the agribusiness ecosystem in Nigeria. And of course, if we can expand that to Africa, to the whole of Africa, fantastic. So what impact have the various you know, factors around your business uh, ecosystem? What's, what are the impacts on your business operations? And how have you been able to navigate the ecosystem and build your business? Right. So um, the first thing I would like to say about this is um, I generally believe that um, agribusinesses are the front line of the reflection of states of a lot of um, African countries, right? Like um, we had discussed earlier, like Peter had said earlier, most of the African countries spend a bulk of, most households in the African countries spend a bulk of their income on food and other consumables. Um, I would say in Nigeria, especially coming back down to Nigeria, it's not with a lot of challenges, right? Running an agribusiness, an agribusiness especially for us, is we do more of like a processing and manufacturing. Um, I would say we, it's like everyone would, would, would know that kind of business is very capital intensive and um, funding and access to funding, the right funding, not just funding, the right funding, long term, cheap funding is like we all know in Nigeria is almost impossible. Um, but we've been able to find um, some um, ways to, to, to tackle that issue. Also very importantly is the um, constant increase in cost of raw materials. Like I said in the last question, activities of people like middlemen also will hoard some of these raw materials and then lack of access, to, direct access to um, um, the farmers also because of the issue of um, um, the whole system, the whole ecosystem is in fragments, um, also increases the price and also cost, um, makes us have quite a big issue of getting the raw materials. Let's take, for example, one of our product lines, um, in the last one year, the prices of the raw materials have increased over 150%. Um, how are you supposed to compete while still trying to make enough uh, margin to satisfy your stakeholders? Um, I'll say it's, it's one of the major issues that we have in food production generally in Nigeria. And then, you know, you don't want to go into the issues of, um, you know, the dwindling, the devaluation of our currency here in Nigeria, um, which will affect your packaging and also all the other raw materials that you use. Um, then, so I believe that generally, even with the government policies, government should create more conducive pro um, of, um, policies that would... Um, that would, that would create a conducive environment for people to thrive. I believe in Nigeria here, yeah, there's so many people, so many young people who have amazing ideas, amazing ideas. Once you sit down and you engage with them, they are hardworking, they, are, they, they have so many ideas, but I feel like we have to just have a conducive environment. 
we don't, I don't have enough time to go into step by step all the different issues we've had with setting up a, um, our, our production plans and everything. But I, I understand that there's so many people who want to do this. But when, they, when I sit down and engage them, I tell them so many things can be very discouraging. Um, about how we've been able to navigate through the ecosystem, I'll say you cannot overemphasize the importance of a good team. And when I say um, a team, I'm not just talking about people who work directly with us um, in the company. We talk about even the whole supply chain, right? People who all the way from our, um, our suppliers of raw materials all the way down to our distributors. Um, we've been fortunate to have quite amazing people that we work with, and that's also helped. Um, another thing also is leveraging technology. When you're starting a business, especially in agribusiness, um, food production, no matter how small it is, make sure you try as much as possible to have, you know, even if it's a small enterprise um, management system, you know, it helps you to be able to project, to be able to keep track of everything. And that has really helped to, for us. Having, using technology like that has been able to help us to cut down a lot of costs, especially in these times when margin is really tight. And then also um, to have more efficient um, operations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Larry, for sharing those. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll now move uh, finally to uh, Peter. And uh, I would like to end this panel discussion talking about money, very important for us youth, you know. So what are the funding mechanisms that young people can explore to launch and accelerate their startup in less than 60 seconds? Uh, wow. Okay, money. <laughs> um, so here, here, is, here is my belief. My belief is that, you know, Africa is going to succeed. I believe Africa has the money. Uh, we just need to move the money from one con some other continents back home, right? So uh, the people who are succeeding, from what I'm hearing uh, Josephine, Landry, and Peter talking about, is teams that know that this is going to be difficult, but everyone is always thinking out the box, right? So the first thing I'll do as a young person, if I'm super young and I'm just getting into this, one, I'll figure out mentorship, right, and my networks. So I probably would go and try and figure out, okay, Landry, can I work with you guys for three months? Even if I'm working for free, I need to figure out how to do value addition. And can I go to Josephine and figure out something, you know, about foods to Peter and figure out distribution, right? I would be really, really hungry for education because we can't conquer a trillion uh, dollar market by not being super, super smart. And this is why I think, uh, you know, African, uh, Nourishing Africa comes in, you know, to integrate these kinds of brains and bring us together. That's the first thing. Second, as Lanre said, technology, you cannot, I mean, Africa will leapfrog and we cannot do things the way we've done it traditionally, right? We have to leverage technology to be able to leapfrog uh, gatekeepers, uh, you talked about kind of getting certifications. I think Africa needs to start finding our own certifications that can be trusted globally. We need to be able to think outside the box. Finally, if you look at money in Africa, you know, maybe now fintech is starting to kind of like uh, uh, overtake agriculture, but all, most of the money coming in in financing is in agriculture, right? So the one way I'd look at it is how can I use blended financing mechanisms to build my company? Are, uh, most of us are really good either at grants, at venture capital, at raising from our friends and family, uh, you know, like I think this is like you have to tap into every one of these mechanisms to uh, build a big company. How that comes together is what, uh, you know, Josephine and, and, and Peter said, you have to have a story, right? Everyone is interested in backing big companies, right? And I think something that I see a lot of youth uh, kind of missing the point is while they build a big company for their neighborhood or for their county, for their province, most people are backing companies that can become the next big global trend. I'm going to end by saying uh, something that Peter mentioned, you know, the bigger companies in, for example, the United States or the place when people benchmark where the United States started is 150 years ago. So you look at big companies like Carnegie or Monsanto, those companies started 
a while back, right? So what I want to see is who are the entrepreneurs today who have a vision that can last a hundred years. If you think you're that kind of person, then I think the community will back you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Peter, for sharing. In fact, you've actually really captured the whole conversation uh, on this panel today, and I wouldn't even bother to do that again. So I would like to say a 